Welcome into episode 198 of the Skate Podcast. I am Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Pru, Scott McLaughlin, and for the third time, our favorite guest of the New England Hockey Journal, Mark Diver. Mark, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Very, uh, very uh, well rested uh, from a weekend of uh, spent some time in the rinks, but not uh, not too much, nothing too stressful. So I'm good. Yeah, nothing like mm-hmm. nothing like being in the hockey rinks in the spring and summertime. Yeah, especially on like a beautiful day like yesterday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> trying to, you know, walking in there and kind of evaluating my uh, life choices, but uh, here we are. <laughs> I know you, you had the the Providence Bruins season and earlier than anticipated too, right? They were you know top seed all year and they get knocked off in the first round. I'm always curious, like. There, there is value in those playoff runs for, for the young players. So, like, when they get knocked out, what's kind of the reaction, you know? Is it, like, a big letdown, missed opportunity um, for, for them as well? Definitely. I think they uh, they don't uh, – and most teams in the American League, they don't care about winning the Calder Cup. They're about developing players, and part of that – a playoff run it goes a long way in, uh, you know, furthering the careers and the development of the young guys. Rochester's going through that right now. Buffalo has terrific prospects. You know, when you finish in last place, like, you know, 15 years in a row, then uh, you get a lot of great draft picks. And they they cashed in, and they got a lot of really good kids in Rochester right now that are uh, involved in a deep playoff run. It would have been nice if Providence could have done that, but uh, you know they they finished first in the in the uh, Eastern Conference and they they got a bye in the first round, so they had two weeks off between games, and that I mean you can't really use that as an excuse, but uh, I'm going to use that as an excuse. Uh, they weren't when they got back to playing games, they weren't you know where they should have been. Uh, if, if they had started up right away after the season ended. So they paid the price, and uh, it was very disappointing to see them go out so quickly and to see just not good performances from, from a lot of players. It, it was uh, too bad. Well, we, we want to get through some of those players because obviously uh, Bruins are going to have a lot of turnover on the NHL roster next year, and you know some of, some of these young guys are going to get a shot to compete for roster spots. And I'll start with the, you know, probably the most exciting name for fans, and that's Fabian Lysel, who is still, you know, their top prospect, or him and Lori, who we'll get to a little later. But, you know, you look at Lysel's season, and we know he had the disappointing World Juniors. Looks like his AHL production dropped off a bit after that as well. Just kind of where is he now after his first full AHL season, and how did how did he kind of finish up? Well, he didn't finish on a good note. Uh, he got knocked out by a concussion on a, a real cheap hit uh, in the playoffs. But he wasn't playing well at the end. Uh, yeah, after the World Juniors, his production fell way off. Um, and, you know, the people uh, I hear people blaming it on fatigue. And he's only 19 years old. He had a long season starting back last July with world juniors training camp, uh, for Sweden. Uh, but you know, just not, uh, he's got a long way to go in terms of, um, developing the strength that it needs to play against men. I think it showed as the season went on, uh, you know, he was losing puck battles and his his play on the wall was, uh, was not where it it's going to need to be because uh, of strength uh, he's a 19 years old he's he's got a boy's body he needs to he, he needs to get some man strength uh, whether he can do that between now and the start of uh, camp this year is you know I'm sure he'll, he'll be working on it but uh, that is something that that needs attention um, and I you know I just was uh, frankly I expected more out of him. I thought his numbers would be better. He had 37 points, which is, uh, you know, not bad for a a 19-year-old first-year pro. But uh, somehow I expected a little more. Uh, And, you know, he could come come in next year and have a great year. And, uh, you know, well, 
get the arrow pointing uh, straight up on his development. But uh, I would have liked to see a little more this year. Uh, but uh, we'll see. And so we had we've had this conversation. I, I don't know if this is where you guys want to go next, but over the last week or so, pretty much since the season ended, and we're getting into talking about the Bruins free agents. Um, we've been having this conversation about the fourth line and whether or not any of the fourth line, maybe besides Greer, would be coming back to Boston, and if they had internal solutions for who they could elevate into one of those roles on the fourth line. I think in particular, it interests me whether or not they have a fourth line center that's ready to come up and, and take that fourth line center spot if Nosik um, doesn't get signed back. So in your mind, what are some of the players that are, are ready for kind of a big chunk or a big slate of games in Boston um, from their development that you've seen, especially if you want to start with someone that might be able to come in at center? Well, I'd start with Mark McLaughlin. Um, I think he uh, he could fill that role next year. Um, would he be as effective as Nosek right off the bat? Well, I don't know about that, but I think he could grow into it. And I think that's uh, you know maybe his his role going forward in the in the Bruins organization is as a fourth line guy, uh, center or possibly right wing. But I think he's effective as a center. Uh, he had a good year in Providence. Uh, he is what he is, right? I mean, he's not gonna he's not gonna put up great numbers. Uh, he's not gonna play on the power play or anything like that. But he's a good penalty killer. He's good on on draws. And he's just an effective uh, bottom six guy. I could see him in that fourth line uh, fourth line slot. Another another name people might think of for that would be Johnny Beecher. So I'm. Um... While like while we're here, I'm curious what you thought of him his first full season in the AHL. I think Johnny Beecher made a lot of progress in the second half of the year, um, but I don't think he's NHL ready at this point. Uh, and who knows? Maybe they. I don't know what they're thinking going into next year, but they may have to, you know, speed up his uh, his timeline here. But I don't think he's NHL ready. Uh, you know, he had a good a good finish. There were times in the first half of the season where, you know, it, he wasn't playing well. He wasn't very effective. But it got better as the year went on. Um, you know, watching New Jersey in the playoffs, a guy like Mike McLeod, uh, a, a kid who's a great skater, uh, as Beecher is, um, my thinking during watching McLeod was that if the Bruins, if, if Beecher could develop into a player like Mike McLeod, uh, and, you know, the fan base isn't going to want to hear this because uh, they'll say, well, Mike who? You know, is that what you want out of a first-round draft pick? Well, he's an effective, a very effective role player on a good NHL team. If the Bruins can get that out of, out of Johnny Beecher, I think they, they ought to be happy. Uh now, can he can he be that guy? Well, that that's a, that's a question. That's an open question. Um, I don't think he's as uh, physical as, as as he needs to be. Um, he still doesn't. He still hesitates at times to use his speed. There's times when he can beat. A, it looks like he can beat a D wide just on speed, and he, for whatever reason, he pulls up a little bit and doesn't uh, doesn't follow through. Uh, with uh, with that speed all the way to the net, but things like that are fixable. Uh, you know, maybe as he gets more comfortable, he'll uh, he'll just uh, you know put the pedal down all the time. Uh, but there were times this season when he did it, times this season when he didn't. He had a couple of fights in the second half of the season, which is not his game, and it's not going to be his game. But you got to be willing to do it uh, at times, right? It doesn't mean that's who you are. It doesn't mean you're, uh, you know, uh, Ryan Reeves. But you got to be able to, if you're going to play a hard uh, bottom six role, you're going to be called on to fight at times. So I, I was encouraged by that. Um, 
you know, the thing, one thing with him is there's not a lot of offensive game there that I see. I think we saw that in at Michigan where he mm-hmm. had, uh, you know, breakaways left and right and, and didn't, didn't finish on them most of the time. I don't think he's, he's not going to be a scorer uh, as he, as he moves up, but I think he can be an effective, you know, fourth, third or fourth line guy to start. And, uh, but I don't think he's there yet. I think uh, I'd look for him to start in the American League next year and 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 see where it takes him. He could have a good first half and, and move up after that, and and you know maybe maybe he finds his niche. But I I would be surprised if he starts the year in the in the NHL. Would it be that offensive side of his game that's why you say he's not ready yet, or is it like you said with Lysel? Maybe he's not put on enough weight. Maybe he's not um, handling the physicality of professionals quite yet. No, I don't think it's the I don't think it's the physicality or the strength. He's mm-hmm. a big, strong kid, uh, and he's put in his time. I think in the in the weight room, uh, it's more more a mindset, uh, a, a, an attitude that uh, okay, I'm going to be an NHL player. I'm going to do whatever it takes to be an NHL player. You know, I think. Uh, he still needs to get over that hump a little bit. So, Mark, the the leader in points for the Providence Bruins this year was was Georgie Merkulov, and I believe it was twenty four goals, thirty one assists, fifty five points in sixty seven games played. So, you know, we're not talking a point per game performance in the A, but obviously he, it was good enough to lead the Bruins in points and. What, what are your thoughts on him? Is he somebody that could push next year? And, and what do you potentially see in him as a possible NHL ceiling and or maybe comparable? I think he could push. Um, uh, he, he was a very, I would say he was a very pleasant surprise. 50-some points as a rookie in the American League is, is good, is very good. Um, and, I mean, he was an effective player all season as, as uh, at the offensive end and he uh he worked at the defensive end he's not a guy sometimes you see guys come and uh everyone knows they need to work on their 200 foot game and and they uh they don't really do it uh for whatever reason georgie i think made a lot of strides in uh, in his defensive play, in his overall play uh, all over the ice. He he was a lot better at the end of the year in his own end than he was at the beginning. And a lot of that was the work he put in, uh, you know, watching video and focusing on those shortcomings that needed to be uh, needed, uh, needed work. So I think he'll push. Uh, but I still, I still think, I'm always that guy that says more time in the American League is better. Uh, I think he'll push. I think he'll play NHL games next year. Um, I don't know if he starts the season in Providence in uh, in Boston. Part of that is that you know I don't know I don't expect Krejci and Bergeron to come back. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a that's uh, I'm breaking any uh, any news there. I, I so there's there's two big holes at center. How do they fill those? Do they? Who knows what they're going to do? Right? We don't know what they're going to do. So maybe there's a maybe there's a slot for him if he has a good training camp. I don't know. Uh, for the player, I think I think he'd be better served by some time in the American League again uh, and. And see where that goes. Maybe by Thanksgiving he's ready to go up and, and be an effective player in the NHL. Um, as far as comparables, I don't really have a, a name uh, off the top of my head that, that he's uh, similar to. Uh, you know, I it occurred to me at times during the year that, you know, maybe he's uh, – there are some similarities between – David Krejci and him in that Krejci's not a burner. He, he's not a fast skater. Uh, he slows the play down. And Georgie does that too. 
he's also not a guy who, uh, I mean, his skating is fine, but he's not, uh, he's not uh, Jakob Lauko, uh, a guy who's just burning into the offensive zone with the puck. He, he's a, he's a slow it down guy, wait for a guy that's open and then hit him with the puck. Uh, can he be like a second line center in the, in the NHL? Yeah, maybe, maybe he can. Uh, but maybe lower in the, in the lineup is more realistic. Maybe third line uh, and a power play presence. He's good on the power play. Uh, one thing that happened this year that uh, was interesting is that uh, when Vinny Letary went to uh, got called up to Boston and then immediately got injured uh, in his first practice. So he was out of Providence's lineup, obviously, and their big play on the power play was setting up the one timer for Letary from the flank with him not there. All of a sudden the, the, the play was to set up uh, Merkeloff with the, the one timer. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden here's this booming slap shot from the side, almost, uh, you know, not Pasternak like, but uh, just a terrific shot. One timer on the power play. He scored a lot of goals that way. And so without Letary there, that kind of opened it up for uh, for Georgie. But uh, I like him as a prospect. I think they, uh, I think they, they made a good move by beating a lot of NHL teams to uh, to get him last a year ago. You know, teams didn't weren't really aware that he was ready to come out, but uh, but he was. And I, you know, I think he, uh, I'm. Uh, I like him as a prospect. I think uh, I think he's going to be a player for them. Uh, one other, another guy I wanted to ask about who, you know, might have a chance depending on what the Bruins decide to do. Uh, we saw him got get called up very late in the season, Brandon Bussey. Um, but you know, we know that potentially trading one of their goalies is, could be on the table for the Bruins this off season. And Bussey obviously had a really strong year in the AHL. Um, do you feel like, you know, he could be ready to be an NHL backup if the Bruins did move one of their goalies or does he maybe still need more seasoning? I think he needs more. He gives up a lot of rebounds. Um, and that's, you know, and that's death in the NHL. Uh, so I think he needs more work there. Uh, but they may be, they may be forced to, if they trade a goalie, you know, it may be uh, time to throw him in the pool and see if he can swim. Uh, but what a year he had. Uh, he He's the reason they finished in first place. I would say he stole five or six games. Uh, they only finished in first place by a point. Uh, so if you take those five or six games out of the equation, uh, they don't finish first. He was just so uh, so good for them. And he's such a battler. He's not technically great, but he battles and battles and battles. There's no shot or puck that he gives up on. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think he has a chance to be uh, definitely an NHL goalie. Is that next year? Is it two years from now? Who knows? But I, I think they, again, they got a really good, uh, good prospect in him uh, in in signing him out of college. Now, would he be someone that you would say you, you he developed maybe a little bit quicker than you would have expected when he came in? What, um, what's been his kind of arc in terms of getting ready to play NHL games? Well, I think his, his arc just keeps going up. Uh, when he came here a year ago out of, out of Western Michigan, after a great year at Western Michigan, um, you know, if you thinking back to uh, the NCAA tournament in Worcester last year, uh, you know, he outplayed Devin Levi and, and they, Western Michigan beat uh, Northeastern in overtime mm -hmm. and Bussy Bussy was better than Levi that day. Uh, and he came into Providence and, you know, I'll, uh, no, uh, no sugarcoating it. He was, he was shaky at times in the stretch down the stretch and in the playoffs. There were times, you know, I, I think one of the coaches said, uh, 
I won't say who it was, but uh, there were times when it looked like he was trying to get out of the way of the puck instead of get in the way. Uh, but he, he straightened that out, uh, you know, going starting into this year. There was none of that. Does he let in a bad one once in a while? Yeah, he does. And, you know, like all goalies, right? But uh, he he's he's able to uh, he's able to park that and uh, get right back on in focus. Um, so I think his uh, you know his arrow is pointing up all the way. I I think uh, he made a lot of progress uh, this year, and I I he just works incredibly hard at it. I th- I think that'll continue uh, going forward. And one last follow up for me on Bussy. If he were to get the call up, say the Bruins do decide to trade Allmark, um, do you think Bussy could handle a decent sized workload in the NHL, or would he be more of you start him out and he's mostly just coming in if you need him, give Swayman a pretty big chunk of the workload, or do you think he could handle a little bit more? I I wouldn't put him in there for like thirty five or forty games, maybe twenty games to start. But that and that all depends on how he, uh, you know, how how does he start? Does he get if he if he's given up a million rebounds and they're and they're scoring on him, then you know maybe he's not he's not ready. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't think he's ready to step in there and 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 take say half the workload. I don't think he's there yet. But I don't th- potentially he's not far off though. So, I mean, when Swayman came in, did I think he accelerated his uh, his timeline when he, from the time he started in Providence to right up to Boston, and then all of a sudden he's an effective NHL goalie. I don't th- I don't know that we expected that because uh, goalies, you know, their development curve is uh, is all over the map a lot of times. Some guys make it right away; other guys it takes years. Uh, so I don't know. We'll uh, I I. I I'm really high on Bussy, uh, you know, and and you know, not only uh, not only is he a good goalie, he's a, he's a really good uh, kid to deal with in the media. I think he uh, he's he's got a great sense of humor. He just he just uh, he gets it. Uh, so he's like Swayman in that regard, you know, a, a, a guy that understands that, uh, you know, talking about the game uh, after practice and after games is, is part of the job too, and he's willing and uh willing and able to do it so that's that's a positive does anyone else have a question about bussy because i have one more (laughs) um it just popped in my head uh does goalie bob have does he work at all in in paying attention to and helping develop the guys in providence or is he just working with them when they get to the nhl level who works with bussy uh in providence it's goalie mike Mike Dunham, uh, he's here all, almost all those every, main guys. Yeah, all those main guys. Right, right. And he's got some stories about Monty in college. Let me tell you, uh, <laughs> not not all of them are fit for publication, but there's some good ones. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's Mike Dunham uh, in Providence, and and with the prospects uh, up and down the pipeline, Mike works with. Uh, or he doesn't work with, but he's he's in constant communication with uh, with uh, Philip Svedback, who plays a, played at Providence College this year, and uh, the kid in Swift Current uh, that uh, was up in Providence at the end of this year. He he made the trek to uh, Western Canada a couple times uh, to to see that kid, and he, he's with he talks to Philip all the time uh, about his game and. Uh, He's a presence every, pretty much every day here in Providence with uh, with the goalies, uh, and I, I, you know, the goalies, the goalies like him. Uh, he's a guy who obviously was, uh, you know, he he checks all the boxes. He was a high draft pick, played in college, played in the NHL, was successful, you know, had a pretty long career. Uh, you know, he's been uh, a lot of places where these young guys hope to get. So too, um, so he's very effective in that role and doesn't get enough credit. You know, goalie Bob deserves all the accolades he gets uh, up in in Boston, but Mike uh, Mike Dunham 
also uh, deserves more credit for what he does in Providence, uh, in my opinion. So, Mark, off the top, Scott mentioned the Bruins' top prospect, Fabian Lysel, or argu arguably his top prospect, their top prospect. Mason Lora is the other one, again, who Scott mentioned. And I wanted to ask about him because if you look at the Bruins' current blue line, you have Dimitri Orloff, left shot defenseman, who obviously is a free agent. And there are – obviously the Bruins are – you know, they're, they have no wiggle room in free agency as of week right now. And another name we see out there is potentially, potentially maybe trading Matt Grizzly because of his value. And just, I don't think the Bruins want to trade Grizzly, but it's just an option. So those are two left shot defense that could possibly not be in Boston. Given the fact that Mason Lorai is 22 and a half would be 23 halfway through next season, next January. It's not like we're talking like an 18 year old kid, right? Is he somebody who, if not by October, potentially midway through next year, could find himself on the left side of, of Boston's blue line? What did you see from him in his brief time after uh, leaving Ohio State this year? I don't see him as a presence in the NHL next year. Uh, maybe in the second half of the year he could come up and play a game or two to fill in for somebody that was injured. Um, I just don't think he's there yet. Uh, he's he, – I mean, he's a fine prospect. He passes the eye test, uh, you know, skates really, really well for a guy that's as, as long as he is. Uh, but the thing I noticed, you know, when he came to Providence, coaches now always talk about playing fast. That's a big thing now in, ho in hockey. Mason Lowry did not play fast in his time in Providence. Uh, he was uh, – and that's – I think that's to be expected. Uh, the pace of the game in the American Hockey League is obviously a lot faster than it is in, in uh, the Big Ten or whatever college level you're at. Uh, so I think he, he was – Mason was taking longer to process what was going on around him than I think he, he's, he's going to have to uh, – moving forward, he's going to have to speed that up, uh, decide – what he's going to do faster, move faster. Uh, but I think that's just something that some time in the American League is going to solve. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, – I know I expect to see stories over the summer and development camp and training camp that, uh, yeah, you know, he, he if he has a good camp, he could uh, he could stick. Uh, and I'll, I'll be reading those stories and thinking to myself, no, I, I, I don't see it. You know, I don't see it. I think he needs some time in the, uh, in the minors. And I think that, uh, the, the staff in Providence, Ryan Mujanel is tremendous with young defensemen. I think, uh, it was interesting to watch, uh, Mason at the end of the year, they would, uh, the day after a game, he would be in the coach's office and they would go over, a coach would go over every one of his puck touches in the game. Every single one. Now, how many how many puck touches does a defenseman have during a, a game? I, I couldn't even begin to estimate, but it's a yeah. lot. It's a lot, right? So every single one of those, they'd go over, oh, okay, you did this. What did you see here? What happened here? So that's the level of coaching that that uh, you know a, a prospect like him is getting down here, and you know next year that'll be going on, and that'll help him ramp his game up to uh, to get up to the uh, NHL speed, and uh, you know help to make him uh, an effective player. So I you know like I said I I think he needs more time, uh, and I, I don't. I don't know how do you so how do you fill the holes? Well, they got they got Jakob Zaboral, who they completely wasted this year. I don't know what their thinking was on that. Uh, you know, when you figure in his knee injury and now this season, he's missed so many so much time in the last two years. Where's he at? You know, is he going to be able to step in? 
uh, I don't know, but I, I don't want to get off on a tangent on him. But um, I think Mason needs time in, in the American League. Uh, I think he's he's really willing to learn. He's uh, first guy on the ice at practice, last guy off. You know, he's in the in the coach's room going over video all the time. You know, he's he's going to do what it takes to uh, to get there and to be a good player in the NHL, I think. So there's just going to have to be, a, a, you know, some patience exercised here uh, by the by the staff and by mostly by the fan base, I think, uh, who think that in some quarters think that he's close. Uh, I don't see it that way. He needs uh, he needs time in the American League. So uh, I don't know. We'll see. I, I do want to get back to Lauco. Oh, sorry, Scott. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, well, just while while we're on the left side of the defense, uh, yeah. you know, one guy who's had a ton of time in the AHL and feel like every year we've heard, oh, he might be ready to push for a job in Boston, might be ready. And I know he played a big role in Providence, but he could leave this offseason as Jack Ashan, who could be an unrestricted free agent. Has he, do you think he's kind of reached the end in the Bruins organization and might want to look elsewhere? Or could he look at this as, hey, maybe maybe there finally is a real opportunity for him to stick, depending on what the Bruins do on defense. Just where do you think he's at? Do you, you know, do you think he still has a future in, in this organization? Well, I think that, I think that's up to him. Uh, you know, if Grizzly is still around, then you still run into the, the issue that some see in two smallish, uh, defenders back there you know you can you can have one but you can't have two that uh, that line of thinking um i think jack's capable of be playing in the nhl uh in the right situation um you know he's he's had a good year in providence this year uh i think he's ready to play in the nhl whether that's in boston i i don't know that's he he'll have the option if he if he you know if he, they don't extend him he'll be a group six free agent as of July one he can walk. I'll be surprised if he doesn't. Uh, there's I think there's better opportunities for him probably uh, more surefire chances that than maybe in Boston. Uh, and it, you know he's 26 years old now, um, so you know what's his. What's his upside at, at age 26? I think what you see is is what he is. Uh, but like I said, I think he's capable of playing in the NHL. And whether he decides to stick around and, and give it another shot with Boston, uh, we'll find out. But uh, I I would expect to see him sign elsewhere for a better opportunity. And, and I wouldn't blame him if he did. That's funny, Scott, because I was about to – stick to the D as well. Is there anyone else on D that you even would consider part of the conversation that um, the Bruins could be looking to, or is, is it really just Laura and Ashawn if he stays? Well, a guy who had a, just a, I thought had a tremendous year is uh, Connor Carrick. And he came up at the end there and he played in Philadelphia and he had a really strong game. Now, granted, that was the Flyers. They they stunk this year, uh, and that was, you know, there wasn't a lot at stake in that game. Uh, it was just kind of garbage time. But uh, having said that, uh, I, Connor played very well that night, and uh, and and he played like that in Providence for most of the year. I mean, he was. I've seen him in the in the league for several years, and. Geez, I never noticed him playing as well as he did this year. He was really good. Um, he's a righty. Uh, you know, I don't know if uh, – I don't know what they think of him, the Bruins. I don't know what Jim Montgomery thinks of him. Jim Montgomery had him briefly in Dallas a few years back. Uh, could he be a guy who could be, like, the seventh defenseman in Boston? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, but I don't know if they think of him in that, in those terms, he'll be a free agent too. Uh, you know, as of July one, I don't know what they, like I said, I don't know what their thought is on him. Uh, 
and whether he could be someone who could, uh, you know, fill in up there uh, as maybe the sixth or the seventh D. Uh, but I think that's uh, that's pretty much it. Um, Ashan, Carrick, Lowry, uh, Mike Callahan, still a prospect a, a long ways away. Um, Kai Wisman, who they signed out of Germany. I think he'll be heading back to Europe. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, I think that's it in terms of defensemen in Providence. Scott and Bridget, did either of you have any more Providence-related questions for Mark? Well, just to get back to Lauko, really just because he was the one prospect. We talked to you about him before, his readiness, his, um, you know, whether or not you thought he was – going to be cracking the NHL lineup. Um, this year we see him get more time than he's ever had up with Boston. Just thoughts on how the Bruins used him? Um, maybe development you've seen from him in his arc since from you first seeing him in Providence um, to where he ended up now? And and maybe what's, what's next for him? Well, I would hope that he's an NHL player now. Um, you know, I, next year, I, geez, I hope he's a, I hope he can play 60, 65, 70 games on the fourth line or maybe the third line in some situations. I hope that he can achieve a level of consistency, which has, you know, eluded him until now as a pro. Uh, you know, you saw it a lot in Boston this year. He'd play a, just a, great game and then you don't notice him for two games and then he's a scratch and then he comes back in with another great game and and then he fades again he needs to even that out uh he's certainly capable of that um but you know i i if he's in providence to start next season or, or at any point next season unless he's rehabbing an injury or something i i'd I'd, I'd be disappointed. I think he's an NHL guy now. And, uh, you know, he's got to play up to that uh, level. Uh, you know, I think there were numerous times in the year when Monty, you know, commented on his effectiveness, uh, you know, when he when he really brought his game. Uh, but there were times in Providence, as there have been over the years, that he'd have a good game and then you wouldn't see him for three or four games. And then he'd have another good game or a couple of good games. So that there's a theme uh, here that he needs to change. Um, so, I, but I think he's ready to, he's, he's ready to be a full-time NHL guy. And uh, if he can achieve that consistency, then I think they, they have themselves a, a, at least a, an effective fourth line presence, speed, you know, instigating, sticking his nose in. Uh, he can be that guy. It's up to him whether he chooses to do it consistently or or not. But uh, I, I I think uh, I think we'll see him up full time next year. Yeah, I, I, I he has in my mind what I call purposeful speed, useful speed. Like a lot of guys have speed, but don't really get their nose in there like you mentioned and 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 he has he 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 skates with a purpose and he ha he has he brings an element of not just speed but tenacity and pestiness that the Bruins could certainly use on that fourth line and and when he dropped the gloves in that game it was it against was it against Columbus or Columbus yeah yeah that yeah. was against a, Sweezy okay. yeah that yeah. was something my that my boy uh, <laughs> my boy Billy Sweezy yeah <laughs> that was that was um I knew he was a tenacious player, but th I wasn't expecting that. I don't know if he did that ever in Providence. You, you know better than us, but I just it was great to see. Like it was a more more or less meaningless game for the Bruins. They've already locked up the President's Trophy, and here he is understanding he still needs to make an impact and and make an impression and spark his team on a night where they didn't have much to play for and whatnot. And I, I would have liked to see him a little bit more in that Florida series, but uh, I have certainly liked what I saw out of him. The consistency, as you mentioned, is something definitely to work on. I think when that's your game, I think it's harder to be consistent than if you're somebody who's out there going through the motions because it's a tougher game to play 82, 82 times a year plus playoffs. Um, I just 
the biggest question I have with Lauko is who's 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 going on his donut runs when he's with Boston. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know. Well, I mean, you know, there's plenty of Duncans uh, around the garden, right? Uh, they're all 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 around the block there. So, uh, you know, I once he's in the NHL, I would I would hope that you know maybe he can work some kind of a deal with uh, with Duncan to uh, get them to deliver. So he doesn't have to go and uh, stop on his way to the rink. Yeah, he can. He can, he can hit up some uh, pastas connections. Pasta, yeah. Can, you know, he's done. He's done some Duncan commercials. <laughs> they can. They can figure it out. Yeah, you know, just just on Lauka, like especially with all the attention on forechecking and how many problems that's caused Boston. And you know, Don Sweeney wanted to. You know, he used the word anxiety on the forecheck. Like they're obviously looking for those guys and. Lauka, we've seen at times like he can be one of those guys with that speed and physicality, and yeah, if he can bring him more consistently, like that's that's exactly the kind of player they want in the fourth line. So it's 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 right there for him. Like it's definitely a wide open opportunity for him to take a job and run with it. Yeah, I mean it's up to him at this point. Uh, what he does, uh, you know, what kind of summer he has, and 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 all of that. I. I uh, I'd be very disappointed, as I said, if he if he ends up back in Providence, and, and I think he'll have to go through waivers. I, I believe, right? The, yeah. This time yeah. around, you know, I so yeah. I don't think they'll I don't think they'll send him down and risk losing him. But uh, yeah, it's time for him to it's time for him to just uh, put his uh, stamp on uh, on a full time NHL job. Yeah, it, it looks like you know he's gonna have the opportunity to seeing as all of the free agents that are coming up in that, in that fourth line role, like we mentioned before. Um, so to Brian, were you ready to kind of switch out a little bit, maybe into other topics besides prospects? Cause I did see Mark, you tweet the other day, um, something about how the governor of Connecticut um, was <laughs> trying to get the whalers trying to get the Arizona coyotes to come to Hartford and, um, I don't know. That story is is something I'm not super familiar with, but obviously they've been trying to get the Whalers back. They 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 still talk about the Whalers. Um, it's like a lot of people still haven't given up on the Whalers out there in Hartford. So, um, I think his name's Ned Lamont. Ned Lamont. Ned Lamont. Uh, Ned. The, yes. The governor. Ned. Governor Ned. Uh, I've you know I lived in Connecticut. Uh, in the eighties for, uh, for several years. Um, and, uh, as far as the whalers go, you know, if all of the people who claim to love the whalers now had supported them back then, they would never have moved. Uh, but yeah, I've been surprised, frankly, that like legitimate, allegedly legitimate news outlets are running with this as if it's a possibility. I don't think there's a snowball's chance in hell that, the, that an NHL team's coming back to Hartford. You know, the building is a dump. Yeah, I, I know. I worked there a few times. <laughs> right, I broadcast right. from there. It's, so you know it's scary, that. honestly. I love watching games in that building because it's the sight lines are great. It's a, the, it's, it's a steep... Uh, like the Boston Garden used to be, uh, you know, a steep uh, climb up to the top, great sight lines, but it's old and falling apart. They haven't kept pace with uh, with w how it needs to be. Uh, can to I give Can I give context on the store and a story for this? When I did a broadcast, when I was in college, actually, so this was a few years ago. I was up where the catwalk is, where they have the broadcasters, which, by the way, is literally just held up by cables, and it shakes, and it's very scary if you're afraid of heights, which I'm not, but I was that day because it did not feel sturdy at all. I When I got off the catwalk, I went to go to the bathroom on that top level, and my foot fell through the floor, and I don't know. It was like there was carpet covering a hole. <laughs> and my foot went through the floor and I had to pull it back out really quickly because I was like, I don't know where that goes. And and I never found out where the hole went, but I ran to the bathroom, came back out and I was like, guys, I just fell through the floor. <laughs> like, that's that's kind of what we're, we're talking about with um, the shape of that building and in different places. They're just like, 
I guess they're just covering holes with carpet at this point. Yeah, and you know when you consider that, uh, you know, the NCAA champion UConn Huskies, men and women, that's their big uh, venue. Uh, well, now they actually just got um, the the new um, center they just built. What the heck's it called? Uh, Toscana Family Ice Forum, which I did a broadcast at, at the end or during the playoffs when they when they first opened it. Um, it's really nice. So I don't I don't know how much they're going to be playing over in Hartford anymore. They they have this really new beautiful facility that has its own issues. I will say um, that they're kind of working on because that. A lot of these buildings aren't designed by people who know hockey. So let's just say they had some logistical issues with where they have the replay and, and everything yeah. and um, things like that. But I'm not yeah, sure how much they're actually going to play over in Hartford now. The referees have to go out in the parking lot to look at the uh, – <laughs> Essentially. You know, don't they? Yeah, uh, it, they have to go way back. Yeah. yeah. No. I, I went to a game there uh, in uh, – I think it was in February. And uh, it's a great building. But, yeah, yeah the sight line – this. There's some questionable sight lines, and, and the video setup is not great. Uh, but, you know, hockey aside, you know, the NCAA championship basketball men's team plays at the Hartford, at the, uh, what's the name of it now? Excel Center. Excel yeah. Center. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, they got to do better <laughs> with the money that they, the basketball money that they get. Uh, you know, you'd think that they would, uh, keep up with maintenance but they haven't and you know that's probably it's not obviously it's not the U university of connecticut's responsibility to uh right. fix up the building that's owned by the city of hartford so uh that's that's another story for another time but the whole so, whalers thing like now the, the governor, story came out of it this didn't the story come out of ned lamont legitimately had a meeting with gary bettman or with no ownership. he said he said I, I'd like to have a meeting with Gary mm -hmm. Bettman. And yeah. like I said, these legitimate, the AP wrote a story based off that, that basically said, well, he's going to meet with Gary Bettman. And, and my response was, well, wait a minute. Does Gary Bettman know this? <laughs> Gar Maybe is, not. Gary, is Gary Bettman going to take time out during the, you know, the stretch run of the Stanley cup playoffs here to meet with Ned Lamont? To talk about the Hartford Whalers, I, it is actually I don't think so. it is important for him to find a, a new location for Arizona. I guess that is a very big deal, but obviously Hartford doesn't make all that much sense. I know yeah. Ned Lamont is a big hockey fan because he was at a game I broadcast the Harvard Yale men's game. He was, you know, we had special security that day actually um, <laughs> for him to come watch because he went to both Harvard and Yale. Well, I mean, there's a half dozen better options than Hartford. For uh, you know, yeah, Houston, Salt Lake City, Quebec City, you know, there's there's a bunch of them. Uh, Kansas City has Kansas a building City. ready to go. Like. <laughs> so you know, the, I, I'm I'm gonna be curious to see how this heart, whole Hartford thing plays out because uh, it seems like uh, old Ned is like uh, playing with the heartstrings of the of yeah. the Whalers fans, you know, by. Yeah throwing this out there as if it's a legitimate possibility. And I don't think for a second that it is, but uh, Hey, I could be wrong. Connecticut is a good hockey state, but I just don't think they're getting that NHL team back. <laughs> no, no. It, it, I mean, they have Quinnipiac. Just, just be happy to have these, these great college hockey teams that they have two, title runs. Yells won. Two, they, two national championships in men's hockey in the last 10 years. You know, Boston can't say that, you know, uh, so they got that going for them, but yeah. uh, the Whalers, no. <laughs> Scott, did you have any anything else for for Mark? No, I'm good. So I I got to get your opinion real quick though, Mark. On I'd be remiss if we didn't, and um, I just got a few minutes left here. But of course, we haven't asked you your opinion on on how the Boston Bruins season ended, and I just I just wanted to see if you. <laughs> If you liked the, if you were trepidatious about the Florida matchup to start with, and for a lot of reasons we discussed in this podcast along the way, you know, just the lack of meaningful games, the lack of consistent line combinations, guys on injured reserve, guys coming in from the depth. There's, there's a lot of inconsistencies where by the time the playoffs came around, it just seemed like the Bruins roster was a melting pot of 
incredible talent, but it just the coaching staff just seemed confused on what what buttons to push, what guys. So there were reasons I think to in hindsight to be concerned about the Bruins in the first round against the Florida team that was playing well. You have the pressure of the President's Trophy and, and the media talking about that, and Kim Neely himself even said he thinks that crept into the room. So I guess where did where did this playoff loss rank for you in in just over the years of Bruins playoff disappointments? And did you possibly see anything like this happening, or did you think they're just too good to knock it out of the first round at least? I thought they were too good. Uh, like a lot of people, I didn't see – a team that was going to beat Boston four, four times in a seven game series. Uh, but I think in hindsight, they should have given more rest to key players. Obviously uh, Bergeron sh should not have played in that Montreal game. All Mark should have gotten more rest. They should have brought Bussy up and given him some games to, ease the workload on, uh, on those other two guys. Uh, and you know, the, the way they ran away with it, you know, looking back on it now, I, I don't think it's any revelation to say that they lost their edge. Their competitive edge was lost. I think in all those games at the end, that didn't mean anything. And in which they, they just rolled over these teams when the playoffs started and you know in so many of those games against florida florida just played so much harder than boston did uh that it end up it ended up biting them and i mean i still i can't believe that they were ahead by a goal in game 7 with 1 minute left and they they couldn't find a way to finish that uh So I, you know, I don't think, so I go way back, obviously. I, it wasn't as bad as 1971. You guys are probably like, oh, 1971, holy crap. How old is this guy? Uh, but uh, I think 71 was worse, but, uh, but this was bad. And uh, yeah, I'm curious to see, this is the kind of trauma that can affect an organization for you know, several years going forward. So we're going to see what what effect this has. Uh, one one uh, point I, I I would make here is that so Kevin Dean was the defensive coach, the defenseman, the last few years under uh, under Butch. He left at the end of last year. Now was he fired or did he leave on his own? I I've heard. Both. Uh, if Kevin Dean is coaching the defense in this series, Boston wins that series. I'm, I'm going to say that flat out. Uh, and Kevin, Kevin was in Providence for a long time with Butch, and Kevin's a friend of mine. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm giving my guy uh, uh, his props here. But I, I just think that Kevin would have. Uh, would have helped to uh, to figure out whatever was going wrong there with the D in the last few games. They were so bad, and they just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I don't think that happens if Kevin Dean is the, is around. Uh, you know, he's only one guy. But uh, anyway, that's my thought. I I don't uh, I don't know John Gruden at all. Uh, I don't know what kind of a coach he is uh, or anything like that. But uh, I'll take Kevin Dean, uh, you know, any day of the week uh, as to coach my D. Um, and I think uh, I think they really missed him in that uh, in that, you know, first round. Yeah. See, that's interesting because that's kind of like that's you can give us that perspective. We didn't really even know that that because we've had the conversation about. Bruce Cassidy and his coaching experience, would he have been able to move the pieces in the playoffs? You know, obviously that is a big, uh, just nobody knows what would have happened if Cassidy stayed here, but talking about the defense, we, we didn't really know that much come, um, you know, what else the Bruins lost off their coaching staff when uh, the turnover happened uh, in last regular season. So that, that is interesting to hear. Cause I mean, really we would just, 
finding so many little things that could have been different for this team to have made it past the first round because it was they had so many chances there were so many little things that I mean that that definitely could have been one of them if they had made some different coaching decisions with the defense in particular so well um, and if you if you look at you know the timing uh you know Kevin left the Bruins before Butch was fired now I don't know like I said I don't know if uh Kevin decided he'd had enough or whether the Bruins decided that they, or Butch decided that they've had, they'd had enough of Kevin. Yeah. There was a point in the season last year. If you all remember when they had a tough time on V one game and Butch sent Kevin to the ninth floor, like, like healthy scratched him <laughs> to watch the next game. You know, That's I, interesting. I think I've never heard, I've never heard of that, uh, of, of a coach. Maybe it's, ha- it's probably happened, you know, and you, and you don't really hear about it because, you know, maybe the media or whoever don't put two and two together. Like why wasn't this guy on the bench when, when he mm-hmm. normally is, uh, but you know, so I don't know if Kevin, I, I don't know exactly what happened there at the end of last year, whether, whether uh, Kevin decided it was time or the Bruins decided it was time. But I, I, what I do know is that the D would have been better this year uh, w- with, uh, with Kevin running the show mm-hmm. as he had previously. And yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think that guys like Connor Clifton, is Connor Clifton an NHL defenseman if, if he's not coached in the minors by Kevin Dean and, uh, and in the NHL too? Does Charlie Mac Charlie McAvoy obviously is a first round draft pick, right? You can't question his credentials, but does he step in and be as good as he is, as good as he was, as fast as he was, without a coach like like Dino, uh, kind of guiding him, you know, this way and that? I I don't know. That this I can't answer that. But all I know is Kevin was a is a, a tremendous coach. Uh, for any young uh, defenseman coming up. Yeah, I think, it, you know, my understanding is like that situation last year got to a point where like it was pretty clear Cassidy and Dean weren't, they weren't going to continue together. And, but you're right with like the timing. It, it kind of feeds the idea that the Bruins initially right after the season weren't planning to fire Cassidy. And it probably took some meetings with players to get there because you're right. Like they, they let him make the change. Like obviously he was involved in that. And you do wonder, you know, Montgomery kept the, the rest of the coaching staff in place. Would he have also kept Kevin Dean if he, if he was still around? So, well, um, and this uh, uh, is there going to be like a on some uh, <laughs> late on Friday afternoon uh, in the coming weeks? Is there going to be a release from the Bruins that uh, you know changes on the coaching staff? This guy or that guy is is leaving, and you know parting ways as they say uh now mm-hmm. instead of just fired uh i don't know are they gonna go you know they're gonna go with the same coaching staff uh, into next year I, I i'm interested to see i'll be surprised if if uh they're all the same faces behind the bench there uh starting next year yeah because part of the idea with montgomery and gruden was to get more offense out of the d and and during the regular season they definitely did i mean you know, yeah. points from defensemen no jumped question. jumped way up, but even that dried up in the playoffs. So it's like, well, if that's going to dry up, then you got to at least take care of business in in your own zone, and that wasn't happening either. So, yeah, well, kind of think, kind of all fell apart. You know, I think uh, Joe Sacco was very well respected as as an assistant coach. Uh, I don't think Chris Kelly's going anywhere. Uh, goalie Bob obviously is is safe. Uh, John Gruden. I don't know. I don't know. I uh, like I said. I would be surprised if they go into next season with the exact same coaching staff that they finished uh, a couple of weeks ago with. I mean, I will say, like, there was one pl- one play just jumps out of my mind that just depicts how awful the D was in that series, and it's I believe it was Game Six early on when Clifton was just inside his own blue line, it was like a, it was more of a neutral zone regroup, but he was just inside his own D zone. And 
I, I believe it was Taylor Hall was was swinging wide on the right on the right wing boards and he had nobody on him. Simple, simple twenty foot pass, right? And Clifton decides to go right up the middle into about a crowd of. It looked like the Taylor Swift concert this weekend. That's how many people were in center ice. And then and, and I watch that and I say to myself, I don't care if you have if you have Dean or or Gruden or Ronald McDonald as your D coach. Like that that's just a play that you cannot make. And so there was definitely just I, I inexplainable poor decision making that from the from the defense. You, you score five goals on the road in game six, you have to win that hockey game. So it was very strange for me to see a Boston Bruins team bow out in the playoffs because of a lack of defense in past years. It's been maybe the offense dried up like Carolina last year, the Bruins just didn't have the, they were just a couple forward short. And, but this year they, they, they scored enough goals in that series to win and the defense and goaltending clearly, and it's team defense, right? Not just the defenseman, but just that, that side of the, of the play just really let them down in the series. Well, and it's, it's details. It's, it's the little details, you know, like that pass. Uh, we haven't seen – this is a, has been a team over the, the last year, two years, that was always very detail-oriented. They, they got those little things right most of the time. As the series went on with Florida, they just kept getting those details wrong. And uh, it, it – I mean, that that sixth game, that's that was a nightmare. <laughs> Obviously, uh, but then Jim uh, Montgomery said after yeah, it was a great hockey game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, uh, right. Uh, uh, <laughs> that was that was a head scratcher. That mm-hmm. that quote. But uh, I mean, what do you say after a game like that? What do you say? <laughs> yeah. Anything but that, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe maybe Brian's on to something and Ronald McDonald is on the coaching staff staff next year. <laughs> yeah, they play like a bunch of clouds back there. So <laughs> it'll be, it'll be. Oh god. But All anyway. right, was there anything else you guys wanted to ask? We've kept Mark a very long time. I feel bad. Um I don't, really I, don't feel it. bad. Don't feel bad. I got nothing going today. I got nothing to do. So yeah, we got all morning to just talk about <laughs> Bruins, but um yeah, I don't know if you guys have any more questions. I wanna give Mark the opportunity to, if we forgot anything, if there's anything you want to get off your chest, anything we're missing, um, any developing takes you have about the Bruins or just anything you, you want to leave us with. Oh, gee, where to start? Um, (laughs) Okay. Another hour. (laughs) I, uh, now this is probably a minority opinion, but, and this is way down on the list of uh, priorities. I really hope they can get a guy or a guy who other teams are afraid of when it comes time to fight. And those opportunities are fewer and and farther between now than than they have been. But I'm not going to say the Bruins got pushed around or bullied at any point, but, uh, Having a guy in the lineup, he's got to be able to play a little bit, but a guy who can make the other team nervous, not just like Lauko with his speed, but if the gloves do drop, a guy that nobody really wants to uh, pair up with. Uh, I don't know who that guy would be, uh, but I think that's something that would uh, would enhance – I know it would enhance Providence, and I think that's something they definitely need. But uh, Boston, I, I don't know. I'm, I probably sound like a dinosaur here, but uh, I, I'd love to see a guy who can fight uh, in the lineup. Uh, I don't think it's, you know, guys like A.J. Greer tried to be that guy this year. He, he's not that guy. Uh, you know, Wayne Simmons proved that at one point during the year, but uh, that's something I would like to see. And, you know, I think they, uh, what do they have? The, their first pick in the draft this year is like number 91. They got, they got to do something in terms of, uh, and this is, uh, you know, I'm stating the obvious here, but they need to upgrade their prospect. Uh, they've been trading away picks and picking low for too long. 
and now their prospect list is uh, is the worst or one of the worst in the league. Uh, that's the price you pay if you're uh, near the top for uh, for like ten straight years. But uh, you know they got to do better in in that area. So I'm not uh, I'm not breaking any new ground with that opinion. But uh, there you have it. <laughs> well, th- that and that especially stood out like when we're asking you about defense, and it's like. Yeah. All right. Well, there's Lori, and uh, you know, with all due respect to Connor Carrick, like a career HLer, tweener type guy. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, they finally have a couple centers that, you know, show some promise, like, you know, below the HL level, even Matthew Poitra, Brett Harrison. But yeah, that the defense in particular is like, it's it's really weak like it's really thin back there so i'm i'm excited uh, about uh poitra i he was really good in the prospects challenge in buffalo last year and uh i think he's going to be a really good player um but i mean you know he looks like he's in junior high so he's so yeah he looks so young yeah uh, there's a long way to go for him but uh you know, one thing you notice when you watch the American Hockey League is a lot of these teams are in the, you know, people rave about their prospect pools, the prospects people. You look in Hartford's lineup, uh, they they beat Providence, obviously, in the playoffs, but are there a lot of prospects in their li- Hartford lineup? There are, there are not. There are like three or four. Zach Jones, you know from UMass, obviously a terrific prospect, a couple other guys, but then there's all these veterans or mid twenties type guys. Uh, that's how you succeed in the American league for a team like uh, Rochester, who I mentioned at the top, they have all these high draft picks. Now they got, I think the 18th pick in the first round last year is piling up points for them. Uh, you know, but Buffalo has been out of it forever. That's how they got those guys, you know. They made the right picks. Boston, at times, who we all know, hasn't made the right picks. And, I'll, you know, that reminds me, uh, the kid playing for Dallas now, Wyatt Johnston, he was picked two spots after uh, um, Lysel. Lysel. I pointed that out on Twitter recently. Just fact, not opinion. Okay, as the guy says, fact, not opinion. He, what did he have? Twenty goals this year. This year, yep. as a nineteen-year-old, and Lysel was, you know, fighting his way through an American Hockey League season. So Dallas made a great pick there. Boston's made great picks in the past on guys like going way back, Bergeron, Marchand. They need to make some more great picks. Guys that no one else, maybe Lorai's, Lorai turns out that way. It's too soon to say, but he was, a what, in the 50s, I think, he was picked. Yeah. Well, the Bruins need to make some of those great picks. Uh, they've done that in the past, but uh, they, they, need to, they need to string some together, uh, which is a problem when you trade all your picks. So... You know, we'll yeah, you're see not going to have any prospects to talk about for a while because they just been trading well, picks away. No, no. So you know, I, I don't know. Well, they, then they uh, then they turn to um. That's that's why you probably seen them turn to some NCAA free agents too mm-hmm. to try to yeah. help maybe accelerate that and you know fill the cupboard a little bit in the meantime. You know. Well, yeah, and and, and, and Mitchell Miller. And Mitchell I knew Miller was going to get there at some point. <laughs> Well, don't get me started on Mitchell Miller because uh, I'm Mark the only, and I had a conversation about this. I'm the right only one. Happened. I'm the only one who saw, you know, that doesn't work for the team. Mm-hmm. That saw Mitchell Miller in practice in two practices, both of his practices in Providence. I I went and watched. Uh, one of them was like at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, and uh, I wanted to see what he looked like. I'm telling you. He's a ball player. I don't know where he's going to end up, and I make, I'm not making any excuses for his behavior. Wow, that kid can play. And 
in hindsight, yeah, they they blew that. They blew that. Do you think they were just tempted by that? They they yeah. realized this could be somebody that was I think off they, the radar and they watched him. And they watched him and they said, "Holy crap, this guy can play and he will play." Uh, but they, I mean, not to nobody wants to re uh, revisit that process, but uh, they blew that. They they didn't have their ducks lined up before they signed him. They, they, there a lot of work needed to be done before they said, Hey, we signed this guy and he's playing for Providence. Now a lot of stuff needed to happen with that kid off the ice before, uh, before he was ready for that, but they blundered into it. They rushed into it and, uh, it blew up in their face. Uh, but I'm telling you that kid can play. So coming soon to a KHL uh, your favorite KHL team? I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. I, I really don't think anybody should be going to Russia at this point. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, well I think yeah, the KHL team right. would be scared to. You know, they saw what happened with Boston. I mean, now, I mean, the, if nothing else, the Bruins made him at least for a couple of weeks a household name in the hockey community. And yeah. you know, if if somebody were to sign him again, it would just. I don't see it going very well for that team either. You know, despite his skill level. Yeah. Kind of just a wasted talent, you could say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I like I said earlier, I, I, I don't uh, excuse his behavior because there's he, there's no excuse for uh, for that. But uh, just the hockey part, the kid, uh, the kid is the kid is good. He's, he's very good. If not for that, if not for what he did off the ice, uh, he w- he would have been a star in the NHL for I, I think for a long time. A star, but, not even just like a serviceable player. You think that? No, he was- I think he was he had the potential to be a star. His 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 puck handling was was just uh, on a no- another level uh, mm-hmm. in terms of. You know, you put him in Providence. Granted, two practices and a, and a bunch of minor league guys. He was the best puck handler by a mile, by a mile, you know, on day one. So I think, uh, I think uh, his hockey ability was, is elite. Uh, you know, his ability as a human being is a different story, but, you know, enough about that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At, Probably at the, the very last- least, like if, if any other team ever does take a chance, they they obviously have to learn from all the things the Bruins didn't have buttoned up, you know, mm-hmm. talking to the victim or victim's family and figuring out exactly what he's done in terms of, you know, trying to better himself or what all that stuff. Like just the fact that the Bruins didn't have answers for that stuff. Well, and even just they had no chance talking to the kid. Now he is a kid, but he came across as, uh, not articulate at all, like at all. Not able to like think on his feet and answer a question that you know, a simple question. You know, he he wasn't prepared. If he had ever had to like do a news conference in Boston with, I mean, you jackals up there would have eaten him alive. You know, <laughs> ready to pounce. Yeah. Well, I remember because the the Bruins sent us sent some of the, uh, us reporters the audio of you talking yeah. to him down there. You know, it, like you said, it was literally just you, and yeah, like you could tell it was like you know there was almost almost like just non responses to you know I don't like you weren't hammering the kids, so they should have been relative. You know, he should have been prepared to answer them. He should have had right. He should have had. He should have spent time with, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you call those people. Uh, that Media coach? Media coach, yeah, there mm-hmm. you go, a media coach. He should have spent like two weeks with a media coach. Okay, this is, here's your answer to this. You know, Yeah. this is what your answer is. And, and when, he, when, the, when the questioning turns to this, here's how you respond. You know, make contact with the, the person you're talking to. I mean, he spent the whole time looking at the at the floor, uh, and you know he's a kid. Put in a 
just a hard situation. Not, uh, you know, you don't want to have too much sympathy for him given given what he did, but he wasn't ready for that. And, yeah. and you almost feel like you need like a manager or an agent that has like a PR background that's like able to under like try to put in perspective for him that this, you know, this could be your last chance and we have to make sure we hammer every single thing the right way in order for you to make this money, in order for you to follow through on your dream. And that just, the help that he would have needed just wasn't there. And like you mentioned, when you talked to him, he wasn't ready for it. I think, honestly, maybe it was ignorance, like, and just thinking ah, it's in the past, you know, but clearly that was going to come back up. He should have known better. The Bruins should have known better. Well, the way they handled it was questionable. Uh, just the, the announcement part. Uh, I was at the rink that day for practice, and it was winding down. So I got in my car and was driving home. And all of a sudden, the, the email lands from the Bruins that they signed, or from the P Bruins, I forget who it was, but that they signed Mitchell Miller. And I was like, you know, are you kidding me? So I like practically did a U-turn to go back. And uh, I don't think they expected to have to make the kid available to the media, even just me that day. Mm -hmm. I think they were unprepared. He was unprepared. Uh, so, I mean, from the, from the get-go, the kid was – they threw him in the deep end, and, and he didn't know how to swim. Uh, so, anyway. Well, it's 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 fascinating because you're talking about a season where the Bruins broke the the wins and points record in the regular season, but the two biggest stories to come out of it would be that one earlier on, and then and then their their end to the season in the playoffs. So, yeah, not not the it's not the greatest uh, six months for us, for the Bruins, despite all the greatness in between. What can you do? Yeah, and I I mean, you know, that's the the whole thing just makes you shake your head, you know. When people like Patrice Bergeron and uh, I think Nick Foligno chimed in that kind of with the the message, like, what are we doing here? Like, wh what are we doing here? Uh, and, you know, those guys wouldn't have had to answer for Mitchell Miller because he wasn't going to be there. No. You know, he was, a, you know, a couple of years at least away from challenging for an NHL job. but And they wouldn't have had to answer – for him, but uh, just to put them on the spot like that was uh, was not good. It was to say it was tone deaf would is an understatement. They just didn't uh, they didn't realize what they were doing. So, so Bridget, I would say to to summarize Mark's answers to you about any lingering Bruins thoughts. I would say he wants the Bruins to replenish the uh, the prospect pool and to go out and sign Scott as an enforcer for about <laughs> maybe and Ronald a, one year league <laughs> men just to kind of have an enforcer on the, on the Bruins. And that's, that's a good off season for me as well. So we'll miss Scott on the podcast, but hopefully we'll get a, a player's insight going forward. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to hold up in that role guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. He's gonna throw oh, popcorn at people. No, well, the only thing he said he's willing to fight for is popcorn. So that's right. if we yeah. say we're going to pay him in popcorn, maybe he'll do it. Yeah. I, co I covered a whole round of Celtics playoff games without popcorn on the ninth floor. Really? It was, yeah. What do they have? Well, until this round, until the Eastern Conference Finals, nothing. Because Celtics games, like, the, the big names in the media are down either courtside or, like, the 100s level. Yeah. So everyone else that gets put up on the ninth floor, they they just, like, don't care about. So there's there's literally <laughs> nothing. Like, the soda machine isn't even on up there but then finally for the eastern conference finals which you know are going to be over tuesday night uh that they put popcorn and snacks and stuff up there i thought but, maybe scott brought his own popcorn this time because he had been complaining all celtics playoffs that there was nothing up there i was like did he bring his own popcorn that wouldn't surprise me all right well mark you've given us an hour and 20 minutes uh, and we really do appreciate it so thank you very much for joining us, Bridget and Scott. If you have any other words, speak now. Yes, no. Bridget, your hand's on the dial. Yeah. All good. <laughs> thanks a lot, Mark. Well, thanks for having me anytime. And uh, 
I'll see you guys. Uh, if not at development camp, then uh, the next season. I'll, I'll, I'll be at development camp. Yep, no, I'll no be better here. way to spend July Fourth week. Right, July Fourth. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Oh, no, maybe I won't be there then. No parades. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No parades. No cookouts. Development right. camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, with all the great prospects. Though. With all the great <laughs> prospects, right. right? Well, Mark, uh, enjoy your summer. Thanks again for coming on. Uh, have a good Memorial Day weekend next week, and um, we will talk to you guys very soon. Thanks for listening. Sounds good. Thanks.